All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Robert Henry. It's February 27th, 2023, Pampin Family Winery in Sherwood. Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first question is why wine? Um, I just like drinking it, I guess. I mean, that's kind of how everything started with everybody, right? In the industry. You kind of like it, tasted it. I have a science background. Um, I was in the pharmaceutical industry and it just, uh, just slowly got um, introduced to it through uh, friends, um, friends of friends. And um, I was kind of at the point in my career as like I need, not really, this is getting kind of boring and I wanted to kind of figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. And um, I thought I'd try teaching a little bit. I had an early experience with that um, right out of college. And um, so I kind of moved down to North Carolina. I was really into motorcycles at the time and that was just perfect place to ride motorcycles in the Smoky Mountains. And I did a lot of odd jobs and um, uh, did some substitute teaching. And then um, I just realized I didn't really like kids at that age, like in high school, junior high. And now I have kids, I love kids. I have a total appreciation for them and I understand them a lot better. But I was like, well, maybe this isn't for me. Um, what's next? What's plan B? I've always had plan A, plan B, plan C. And uh, um, I was like, well, I really like wine. Is there any wineries in the area? And there's one, I think there's one winery in, in Asheville, North Carolina. It was, um, it was Biltmore Estate, I think the name of it is. And I talked to them and they weren't hiring. So uh, originally I was from the Finger Lakes and well, there's a big wine region up there. Let's see, let's try that. And it was in the fall, it was really bad timing. And I moved back home for a little bit. Um, and then uh, they weren't hiring, it was the end of harvest, and I think any job they had was like three fifty an hour. I'm like, eh, I'm, not gonna, <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. So what's the next closest wine region to go to? And that was Virginia. So I just basically called every single winery in the state of Virginia and asked, hey, do you need any, this is my experience, you need somebody to run your lab? Um, these are my skills and uh, I guess Horton, Horton Vineyards was the only one that said, yeah, we might have a position for you, some cellar work, uh, entry level. And I just loaded up my car and moved to Virginia and luckily found a, a good roommate right away. And um, it was in Charlottesville, so it was a good area, great public radio there, uh, great rock and roll college station. So it was, it was a nice place to live. Um, and then, um, I really love the work. I love the solid work. I love the physicality of it. Uh, I love the people I was working with. I've had just a great opportunity through my career to work with great people and um, have really kind of pushed me along as far as my understanding. So there um, I worked with Graham, Graham Bell. He was the winemaker there and they had a uh, consultant, Alan Kinney. Um, and then Michael Henney was the cellar master there. So um, I learned most of my cellar skills there how to smell Brett, what Brett smelled like. Um, basics, basic stuff, just like I've never even seen a grape or, or grape seed or a wine barrel and learn how to drive a forklift. Not very successfully, but, um, and drive a tractor. And I just really love, I just love the, the process of it. And, uh, and um, I still really do to this day. I, I really enjoy the process of winemaking. I love I like topping barrels. I like taking care of things and making sure everything is perfect and the wine is safe and um, uh, kind of the best it can be. And so from there, I was like, well, I really like this. I think I can do this. I really, it's, it's just a multidisciplinary, you gotta be a mechanic. You have to understand plant science. You have the wine thing, which is, you know, it's, it's a big part of it, but all the little things that, um, you have to wear a lot of hats and have a lot of understanding of, of um, how things work. You know, during harvest, pump can break, you gotta fix it. Uh, your glycol system goes down, you have to understand that, how that works. Uh, uh, you're always reacting to things, um, which is great. Um, so there as well, I should probably get education. So um, uh, it was either Davis or Fresno State. And um, back then, back when, when was that? Early to, I guess it was 98, I guess. Um, Back then, school was basically for free in California. Um, I went to Fresno. I liked the, as far as the hands-on, it's sort of like a trade school. 
um, approach to things. Um, I had all my science background, so I didn't really need to take any science courses, which were great, and I accepted all those. And um, so I was there for two years. Um, I met some friends who are still up here, Steve Goff, I went to school with him, Thomas Hausman. Um, he was, we were all classmates. Um, I think Grant Coulter, too. We were all kind of in that area. And um, so Fresno State was great. I just took, um, I think I only paid like $900 a semester, I think. And for 14 credits, that's what it was. And anything above that was free. So I, I probably took about 23 credits a semester. And I just took every single class I could take. I took every single, anything that fit my, my schedule that related to viticulture and plant science, uh, which I knew was really important to know that. It's a certain level of winemaking. It's, it's all kind of viticulture on a certain level. Um, so I have like maybe six credits short of a plant science degree. I took soils, I took a tractor class, I took crop project, I took uh, integrated pest management, I took graduate level soils. Um, so it was just like a nine to five job for me. And um, I wish I did that with my undergraduate degree because uh, I don't know if I was mature enough to go <laughs> to the level of, uh, I went to a great school for undergrad, uh, University of Scranton. Um, and I. I I don't know if I squandered that equation, that, that education, but I, I, if I was more mature, I could have taken more, more advantage of it. But um, no, so I just took everything I could fit in my class, and I went to school at eight o'clock and came home at six every day, and uh, uh, and then worked in the summers there uh, uh, with research with the viticulture team um, there, uh, and then. Um, I was really involved. I was a treasurer for the Vit Club and the and the, and the Enology Society. So I had the purse strings and and I got them all on the, the software and the Microsoft money you know, when that was available. And uh, and we were able to buy glasses for the the Enology Club and um, uh, so that that was a great experience. And um, I wish I was still in more contact with those people. But uh, from there, I really took, uh, I really learned about a lot about the viticulture and um, the philosophy behind that, as far as what you want. Um, and then from there, I kind of got the dream job right out of school. Um, I moved up. I got married, graduated, and then I got a job all in the same month. And I got a job at Palmire uh, with Aaron Green in Napa, uh, and that was just a. Um, that was a great experience. I really loved Erin. Um, we had a great relationship. She taught me a lot. Um, oh, I skipped. I skipped the whole thing. I skipped when I first moved out to California. Yeah, I worked at uh, Leticia. I did the same thing. I called every single winery. It was like, well, North Coast, like Central Coast looks kind of cool. I did some research, um, and I just called every winery in that area in the Edna Valley there, and then got a job with John Clark at Leticia at the time. And I wanted to establish my California residency because if you're a resident, then, then, you get the cheap, then you get the cheap stuff. And I wanted a little more experience before getting into school so I have an idea of, you know, these are the things I want to learn, these are the things I'm interested in. And I worked with him for a year. Um, a lot of things I learned from him is uh, uh, there has to be a certain practicality in winemaking that you need to, he came from Corbett Canyon, he came from a, a different, like a big, you know, large um, winery. Um, Ticha was a little smaller. Um, but I learned from his, like in the bottom, you have to be, you have to be practical in your approach to winemaking. You can't do like crazy, silly stuff. Um, you can't like punch down one half of the cap and pump over the other or, you know, <laughs> all this kind of, uh, um, Stuff so, and then, uh, and and another thing I learned from him is that anyone can be fooled as far as tasting wine, and how you approach it, and how you can manipulate a tasting uh, for better or worse. Or um, uh, he was a great guy. I learned he was very uh, patient. And I learned a lot, and uh, uh, and then I went to Fresno State because I, I had the residency, and then from Fresno State I went to Palmire, and I was at Palmire till 2008, so six years. It felt like 20. Um, it was really hard. Uh, I really worked hard at that place. It was sort of my, my pay the dues kind of thing. And when I came here, it was like, I deserve this. I mean, <laughs> this is great. I worked at, at it was a custom crush. Uh, Palmire was made out of an Apple wine company. It was just chaos. It was, you were just 
uh, in the constant battle between the forces of evil. Uh, I don't know, all the different clients there, all the different bugs, all the Brettanomyces, all the, all the stuff. Um, uh, just finding fittings during harvest. People used to have them all in their pockets and you go to the board to, because my job there was, I mean, we had, um, the other people had to do the work. It was a custom crush facility. So they had their people, but I was there to supervise everything. And a lot of times I, I just did the work myself and make sure disasters didn't happen because, um, Deacon ruined a whole lineage. I mean, there's so many stories. I should like write a little, maybe there should be like a little piece after this, like winery stories, like a little addendum about one, the, one great story was uh, uh, at one point, uh, Blanquet was made there, Bryant family was made there, Colgan, because Helen Turley, she, uh, Aaron worked with her. So how, how Aaron was uh, the winemaker at Nap Wine Company and then Helen moved her stuff there and then she hired Aaron because she knew the whole thing. And, um, but at the one point, um, during one harvest, I think uh, they, had the, they had the pump over device hooked in the wrong tank. So every tank got everyone else's wine. So it went from this here and Bryant family got pumped into Colgan. Then Colgan, Blend, Bryant family got pumped into this uh, free whatever. And the last one was like some bulk wine at the very end and it got all the <laughs> All that great juice at the very end. And so many stories. I mean, John Clark was great. Uh, he'd always tell me all kinds of uh, crazy stories. People would go out for lunch, they'd come back, the tank would be empty, or the, the owner's son would be working, and he'd forget something and drain 40,000 gallons of wine down the drain and, and pollute the Salinas River. <laughs> I mean, just, just really, really nightmare stories. Uh, um, so things can happen pretty fast. Um, so I was always kind of fighting that at Paul Meyer and, uh, and Aaron's great. I did all the blending with her. Um, I'd have a cot and I'd have to lay down and sleep because those wines were so high alcohol. I mean, 15, five, 15, like pushing 16. And we taste for two hours, three hours. And we have breathalyzers and I just lay down. I'm like, I, I need to go to sleep. And we had the breathalyzer, so we get home um, on Route 29 there. Um, but I worked, yeah, it was very, uh, did a lot of changes there, made things better. I think the wine went, made, was better. I kind of pushed the style to more, like maybe we should get some of this alcohol out of this wine. I mean, it's kind of, and I felt I, my influence was to kind of tighten up the style a little bit, maybe a little more, um, not so industrial strength. I can't, that, that was the motto, I can't believe it. I mean, that was Paul Meyer. <laughs> we make industrial strength. I saw an interview with Aaron uh, recently. Um, now, of course, that's out of, that's not trendy in, uh, in the wine industry, but um, we made, I think we made some great wine there. Um, and she taught me there, the key thing was high risk, high reward. I mean, you gotta push it sometimes. And a lot of times in, uh, in winemaking, it sucks now if we pick it and um, let's just roll a dice and see what happens. Uh, eventually you have to be a winemaker and make the wine. The fruit is not just going to get better and better the longer you leave it. A lot of times it kind of plateaus and just... Um, but that was, that was the lesson there. It's like, well, yeah, you got to kind of hang it out there to make um, great stuff. You can't play it safe a lot of times. You got to minimize risks and you can control risks and you can control things, but um, I mean, for the longest time, we didn't even add sulfur to our, our fermenters, when, like to the juice. And um, we had all kinds of micro scans there. And God, every year we're like, oh, we got rods. Every, it was just like every day we, we kind of, you know, this is a microscope now. That's why I learned another piece. Because I, I kind of make wine the same way as I, I did from, uh, from Aaron. And we're indigenous here, East. Um, and you kind of do that, you need a microscope. You got to really keep an eye on what's going on. Um, but there, and then eventually I kind of convinced her, I was like, yeah, can we just add like maybe 30 parts and call it good? <laughs> and like keep the, the bacteria because once things go bad and you have to whack it with sulfur, it's never, it's not, it's, the wine is just not going to be, it's not going to help it. Um, so it was a great experience with her and I had, a, um, I was, um, it's great working for them. I had a, it's great working for people that great wine sellers, rich people that have uh, DRC, DRC. 
uh, and Lafitte and Latour and all that stuff. So I've been, um, so I tasted a lot of great wines there, a lot of great experiences. It really expanded my mind. Uh, we went to Burgundy twice, two years in a row. I mean, not just once, but twice. <laughs> And then we went to Champagne, and just to, just to have that that um, perspective of, of Burgundy, because we started a, a, a Pinot program there um, when I was there in 2005. So Aaron was like, "Hey, we need to go to Burgundy. That's where they make Pinot Noir. Um, let's go there." And we visited great cellars. Um, just an amazing experience. Um, I don't know if my life's been downhill ever since then, but. <laughs> A company paid trip to Burgundy, like all expenses paid. We stay at the uh, Francois Frere house with the infinity pool and, and um, had great Chardonnay. Uh, uh, went to visit all the great vineyards. It was just a, it was just a great trip. Um, and then so my palate and then plus with food, just the experience there. We went to the French Laundry for our Christmas dinner every year. Um, so to be able to go to the mountain and see, uh, and it gives you a great perspective and, and it's really informed my winemaking also is when you, when you taste these icons and these, these paradigms of the wine industry, you kind of get that picture in your mind, that snapshot as far as what, what a great wine is and what it, what it isn't. And I've, I've kind of, that's kind of what I try to do here is um, that imprint has been in, in my brain from tasting uh, amazing wines and, and just to try to emulate those or not really, I don't know, emulate them, I kind of copy them, but I'm trying to, um, I kind of have uh, an idea of, uh, of a universal aesthetic as far as things. I think we're programmed um, as a survival thing that we know kind of what tastes good and what isn't and what's a pretty riparian scene and this like, yeah, it's safe, you know, see all that safe area where predators can't get us. And, um, I think there's something that that's programmed into us and, um, and genius when you recognize uh, genius in either music or painting, um, when something is recognizable quality, uh, or genius, um, then it's it, then I think people can and, and if you make wine that it's it's much it's much greater to make a wine that's going to, to reach the largest audience possible uh, to be successful and um, what was great about working with Erin at Palmer too is her approach was um, it's like we need to agree on the blend because she her her idea was like well some people are going to love the wine I make and some people are going to like it like what you like, and if we both like the same thing, that doubles the amount of people, potentially, they're really gonna love it. Um, so, uh, yeah, just tasting great wines and having that perspective and, and recognizing, like, wow, that's an emotional experience um, when you taste a great wine. Um, and that's kind of what I kind of try to go for, I guess, uh, as far as my wine. It has to move me emotionally, it has to be good. Uh, it has to have a delicious factor, of course. Um, um, I'm not, I don't go to extremes in any way. I'm kind of the middle path um, as far as my way making, I think. I don't pick things too early. I don't pick them too late. Um, I know um, the wine has to be balanced, has to be beautiful, uh, has to be delicious, has to be um, pure. Um, a lot of analogy I use is um, I'm a, uh, a guitar player, so I mean, there's your power chords, in which are certain wines, like a power chord wine, uh, and then there's the, the all six strings when you hit everything and it has that depth, and that's kind of kind of what I, I go for, I guess, as far as our wines that I'm making here. Um, kind of jumping a lot about around about. This is like an interview when I have my interns. I talk to interns for like an hour and a half, and I just. <laughs> And I try to talk them out of the job first before they hire. It's like, well, I don't think, I don't know if you're really gonna like it here. We kind of, but, um, so from Palmyre, um, I've always had in the back of my mind that I love the Northwest as far as the wines here. I think they, they strike a really great balance between the two, you know, Bordeaux and New World kind of thing. Um, I always, uh, I think my, um, I think it was a Hedges 99 Reserve that I had, one of my first Washington wines. And back then, I mean, I was, I was kind of a wine drinker then because you could afford to be a wine drinker. I mean, when I first started, um, you can get great Rhones for 15 bucks, um, 
great Rieslings for like 15, you know, Cabinets, Spätlese. Now they're 30, 35. Yeah, so uh, by the price point, I mean, it's like, wow, these are, I'm in college. I mean, I'm, I'm basically living off my college loans. I mean, I'm not, this is an expensive thing. Like, wine is very expensive. So I had the, uh, uh, the hedges, the Cabernet, and that was kind of the light went off. I'm like, wow, that is, um, that is great, precise, very pure, very, um, lots of energy in the wines. And, and at the time, um, I think the director there at the program was, uh, um, God, what was his first name? It's Dr. Wample. He was up at WSU there and he came down to Fresno State, kind of ran their program. And so I kind of picked in his mind and like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I kind of like try these and I got as many as I could. And I was just like, wow, I just like the style. I just, and it's always been in my back of my mind. And then I moved up to Napa and did that whole thing there, um, which is kind of the, well, it's different. I mean, I, I'm, I'm surprised when I still have those wines that, that, that I like them. Because I've, I've gone to the, um, I don't, I don't want to say I, I uh, it's a style of wine. I hate to say that like a wine is no good or um, personally, like when people make those declarations, I think they're full of shit. Um, when someone says this isn't a good wine and you should be drinking this or like the wines from here, I mean, it's all, it's all subjective and it's all personal preference. and. Um, I think it's a disservice for, for someone to say that you shouldn't like this and you should like this. It's, it's everyone's personal preference. Um, but the wines really resonated with me and I went to Napa and, and now I still drink those wines. I still have a lot of my old wines from Palmer and I'm like, wow, I, I think I like this. I'm usually pretty surprised because um, the wines were balanced and, and very well polished. And, and, um, but. Uh, but I guess, uh, I guess the point I was trying to make is I always had it that I wanted to move up here and wanted that's where I kind of wanted to plant my flag eventually. And then this job came up in uh, 2005, I think. And I, I kind of knew it. Someone drew my attention to it. And I was like, well, I'm still learning a lot here at Palmer. I really love working with Aaron. I'm going to stay here. I mean, this is, um, we're starting a Pinot program. I'm going to be doing that. Um, um, there's just a lot more I can still do here and, and feel like I'm being a success and making a contribution to the program. Um, and then it came up again in 2008 and I kind of took the bait. Um, somebody, I think somebody, a headhunter called me or I, I don't know what, how it happened and I came up here and I'm like, wow, this is like, this is the dream job. I mean, how, you can't really get much better than this here to have your own winery. Um, I don't have to trade for gaskets during harvest because everyone has them in their pockets and they disappear off the board and I'm like, anyone got a two inch? I got an inch and a half here. You want to trade? Just to get any work done at Napa Wine Company and it was, uh, it got to the point where I just couldn't handle it. I just kind of, I was like, I just can't make wine under these conditions. There's just too much, there's too much BS and um, there's too many things that go wrong. Um, and then I came up here, I guess, and uh, uh, first harvest was very tough. I kind of did it all myself, I think. Um, it's kind of, I would, I have, I can honestly say it was a heroic effort because uh, I came up here in August, I think, and I had to learn a whole, everything up here. I had to visit all the vineyards. It was a whole new thing. Um, and at one point I was, I was thinking it was horse heaven, I was in the horse heaven the hills there and I'm looking out in a desolate, <laughs> Like, there's two colors. There's blue sky and then straw, basically wheat. And I'm like, what have I done? Like, what, what, what have I done? Like, this was a huge mistake. Like, this is, this is crazy. Like, this was, it was such a huge move for me to come up here. Um, and then I was working, I mean, I was driving out. I was making wine. I would I'd get up at 5 in the morning, drive out, visit all the vineyards, come back here, do make wine until 1 in the morning, and then get like four hours of sleep and then drive out there again, um, falling asleep like in rest areas and gas stations. And uh, I got it done though, I did. And then I've had interns, like vineyard interns ever since like to make that drive. But um, no, it was a tough vintage and uh, it was sort of a, it was a great vintage just because all the things I, I always thought we should have done at Palmer, I can now do here. And, um, 
and then slowly, uh, but the imprint upon, I mean, wherever you work, that imprint is always on you, I think, as a winemaker. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of winemakers I'm sure you've talked to is they make the wine the same way they did at their very first job. I mean, there's a certain um, thing. But now I would say I, there isn't much of anything I do that we did. I'm kind of my own. Um, it took maybe four years, I guess, because it's kind of a slow process. And now I find since maybe the 2015 vintage, I'm finally really like this is this is like what I do now. This is my style and this is how I do things. Um, which is exciting and it's, it's, it's been an incredible opportunity to have that, that freedom here. It's almost a luxury because a lot of places you'll come in and say this is our wine style. Um, we use 80% new wood and this is what people like and, and that's kind of what you have to do. Of course, I mean you're working for somebody else unless you start your own thing. Um, but uh, here, I, I established the style. This was like a brand new. So we're kind of making my, what I think. And, and of course, I collaborated with Art in the beginning. Um, but he was on board as far as what we're trying to do, as far as minimum wood and um, the style of wine I, I want to make, which is you know the, the, the purity and the precision. Um, we're about 15% new wood here, I think, on Cabernets, which is kind of strange. Um, to me, wood is just makeup. Um, I mean, I think our wines are, are, are natural beauties. And if you, if you grow it right, and you pick it right, and you ferment it right, and you make it right, then wood, in a certain level, is just a, it just covers up certain things. I mean, there is, it does help out in certain situations. I find that in Chardonnay, it does. Um, but um, no, but to have that freedom and that and the ability to source the fruit and and um, control everything, I mean, we we purchase our fruit, which is not the most ideal thing. Um, we're competing with a lot of wineries that are state grown and have control of their own fruit sources. But um, luckily in Washington, it's just like a little different story out there where um, people can make money growing grapes out there because they can do the scale. There's not all the disease pressure here. Um, you can control a lot of things through irrigation. Um, so there's still places, there's some consolidation that's going on there, which is, um, which is kind of a drag. But uh, you can still source some of the best fruit through grower. I mean, it's the best stuff you're not going to get. You've got to get on a waiting list, of course. And, but uh, there is the opportunity for a winemaker or someone to go in there and, and, and make a program out of some really top end stuff. So. Uh, Washington, to me, was a land of opportunity. I don't think some of the, some of the best sites there are probably aren't even planted yet. Um, there, of course, the challenge is water, um, to get the water rights and stuff like that. But, um, but here, no, I don't, really, um, I don't really know much about the Oregon wine industry, quite frankly. I mean, I, don't, I have two friends I hang out with. Um, I don't, um, I'm not really much a wine drinker anymore. Um, I'm an endurance athlete, so alcohol to me is just not, um, and uh, it's just not in the program. Um, I have friends that are still fans. I mean, you go to their house and you open their fridge, and there's like four bottles of, I don't open bottle, open bottles of wine in the fridge, and they still. Um, but for me, I just, uh, um, I kind of don't. I just need that 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 refresher maybe once or twice a year. I need that because I, uh, to me, I drink wine for the emotional experience. I want to be moved. I want to taste it. I want to just, you know, just close my eyes. And, um, and as long as I get that a couple times a year, um, and that recharges me, I say, yeah, I'm in the right, I'm, I enjoy this. I'm in the right business. I still enjoy it. Um, but as far as drinking wine or knowing what's, um, no, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of ignorant um, because I don't, I'm kind of a Washington winemaker more than an Oregon winemaker. Uh, here, we're starting a Chardonnay, I started a Chardonnay program in 2018, and the vineyard's right here. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. I don't have to drive four hours to get there. Uh, I can manage the vines myself. I go out there and take care of, you know, like I'm a little gardener with my hat, and <laughs> go out there. I really enjoy that and, and perfecting things, and. Um, uh, for me to, uh, and like I said, the process is what I enjoy um, as far as the results and wine scores and all that stuff. I mean, that, 
That makes you feel good, but um, you can't, if you're in this business and you're just trying to go for that, you're, I think it's a miserable, because you can't chase that, really, I don't think. Um, but yeah, I love, I love the physical part of it. I love the, I love the seller work. I love it. Um, and uh, I love the multitasking and, and getting something done. I did a lot of work last week and I had three things going at once and I'm done with the day. I was like, there's no one could have done a better, like more efficient job than I just did. I mean, that was perfect. Oh, granted, I like, I waited a little bit because I didn't get this going, but I had every ball up in the air and it was just, it was just like a, like a, I was like a conductor. And, and the, when it was all done, it was, the wine was just as good as it could have been, I think. It was protected and there was no O2 pickup and every little detail was in order and uh, precise and um, I guess I'm very meticulous and that's, um, and for me it's, it's like I want to sleep at night. Um, I have to live with these decisions for the next 20 years and then I never want to have regrets or wake up in the middle of the night and it's like, oh, I really should have, you know, when I did that, I should have kept that barrel separate and um, I think in this business, uh, what I do is laziness is sort of that's what gets you because it's so easy to cut corners or like, ah, I don't want, you know, well, for me anyway, I mean, I think anyone has, has a certain level of that, but for me, uh, I just want to sleep at night and know that when I, I could, I did the, the best job I did of and beyond duty, um, that could have done and, um, I don't have any regrets as far as any, any wine I put in the bottles. I've learned things, sure, that I didn't know before, but I make those changes and I'm always moving. Um, I'm always moving forward. Uh, I think as, as a winemaker, you have to be in the state of becoming at all times. I mean, you're like a musician that you're never going to master the guitar. I've been playing guitar for 30 years and my 12 year old is like catching up to me. Um, but with winemaking, I always say I'm always an open book because next year I'm going to be doing something different. I'm going to I'm always perfecting and pushing things forward um, in the wine. And sometimes, I mean, uh, my old boss used to say you have to relearn things every ten years, where you kind of like, oh, I made that mistake ten years ago. Now I <laughs> do that, but. Um, so I, I kind of go through my things. I'm kind of all in. I like, I've never, um, as far as our quantity here, it's hard to do little experiments. It's just impossible. I mean, coming from a scientific background, you can't control the variables. I think a lot of experimentation is, I mean, you can't, how can you experiment with yeast? I mean, yeast are everywhere. Like you have a fermenter right next door, it has this yeast and this yeast, they're all gonna kind of, they're all gonna mix together. I mean, um, so, um, yeah, I kind of, I'm always moving ahead and I'm always becoming and that's what's keeping me in the industry because every other job I've had, I've gotten bored at and lose interest. But this is, uh, it's constantly a challenge and um, I think that's what I enjoy the most about it is you're always, you're always on your toes and it can always be better, I think is kind of what, how I look at it. Um, but my cap's getting pretty, pretty good. I don't know how much better <laughs> after, after 10 vintages, I think I kind of, kind of nailed, nailed that down. And that's why it's, the Chardonnay for me is exciting. Cause that's a new thing that I can control, <laughs> control and do, do my bidding, I guess. Tell me about the, as you were hired here in 2008, as you were coming in, what was the, what was the pitch for you? What, what, what were you? tasked with doing uh, right away? What was, what was the goal of this winery? Um, well, the goal was, was my goal, is to make the best wine possible. I mean, they had all the equipment, we had all the, uh, the technology. Um, there weren't really any excuses that we couldn't do what we wanted to do. Um, and that's what I want, I mean, that's my goal, is to make the best wine in the, that can stand up to anything. I'll, I'll put our wine, our Bordeaux, and, uh, I'll take the tech, the, Pepsi challenge to anything. I mean, I think it could stand up and it's world class. And that's, that was the, um, in fact, I don't think I, I could work at any place where that wasn't the goal. Cause that's, um, to me, that's, that's why I'm in the business. I'm not here to make money. I'm not here to, you know, like, oh, I like go out drinking in fancy restaurants and, you know, go tasting groups and stuff like that. I'm here to kind of, I'm just, that's my only goal really is to make the best wine possible. 
Um, and that's why I took the job. We're kind of on the same page with that. Because that's the environment I was at Palmyre. I mean, and, and that's a, um, it's a certain mindset. I mean, you, you, you just don't make compromises. I mean, the, the level of, of wine that you make, I think, um, well, I think sometimes cheaper wines are way harder to make than expensive wines. Um, because the margins are so tight, I don't think I can make any dollar bottle of wine like someone, like those guys would run circles around me as a winemaker. And those facilities, I really respect those people, um, like people at Gallo and those, I mean, they are like, they're heavy duty winemakers. I mean, just like the brewers at Budweiser, I mean, they are world class. Um, but um, I diverge from my point, but here is, uh, yeah, the, 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 for me, this is kind of, um, it's the level where I'm at is a lot of it is viticulture, which I really enjoy, um, and getting the fruit as good as it can be. Um, I'm not a non-interventionalist. Yeah, inter interventionalist. Yeah, I forgot a syllable. Um, yeah, I got to make a wine as, 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 as good as it's going to be. If it's, uh, it's a hot year and needs acid, I'm going to add acid. I, I have a benchmark I'm trying to achieve. I'm not um, someone who's... I mean, that's what a winemaker does, I, I think, in my opinion, anyway. It's just my opinion. Um, I, uh, qu uh, consistency is quality in its own right. I mean, if you have to be, if you're developing a brand, your wine has to be good all the time. I mean, you're only as good as your last vintage. So you have to have it be pushing the quality consistently and hitting that mark every time. And, um, Granted, I mean, the vintages are different. There's the wines, but they're all siblings. I mean, they're all related. Um, if you taste, if we could do a vertical right now for every single wine I've made, um, you would see the similarity that they're like, yes, this is the same, um, this is the same, uh, this has a certain voice to it. And I think that any, um, another point I want to make is that, uh, since I'm a guitar player, I mean, I love, uh, all the great guitar players have their own voice. I mean, you hear Frank Zappa, like, oh, and you hear Jerry Garcia, you hear Jimi Hendrix, uh, Mark Knopfler, they all have their own voice that you can hear. And, and, and as a winemaker, I have to express, I want an individual, individual voice in my wine, where you taste it and say, oh, okay, that's, that's Pamplin, that's classic styled, old, old school, old world, um, Napa in the 70s style Cabernet. Uh, it's not too big. It's not like underripe and tart and uh, it's not over oaked. It's just a classic. Uh, when you taste our wines, you taste Cabernet. You're not tasting wood. You're tasting the fruit um, and the, uh, the vineyard and uh, my aesthetic, basically, what I think a good wine should be. Uh, and if it's messed up, I'm going to fix it. I mean, why wouldn't you? Like, if, if wine has smoke taint in it, that's not terroir. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, that is, in my opinion, of course, uh, that's a flaw. I mean, you can spin it any way you want. But, uh, and of course, there's an ask for every seat. I mean, someone's going to love that smoky wine. But you're never going to find me making one. I mean, uh, and uh, certain other flaws, too. Um, so I don't know if they answer your question or not. I hope so. <laughs> I think I answered it five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little extra color commentary yeah. on top. Uh, you talked about viticulture a couple times in the interview and the kind of the importance of it and your, your interest in it. So tell me about the, how you manage vineyards that aren't in your backyard, what you're, what you're looking for and, and sort of the challenge and um, the goal of, of what you're doing with vineyards that are, you know, hours away. Right. Um, I guess I manage growers. Um, I, only, I only purchase fruit from growers who I know that are going to, or we're on the same page of what we think quality is and what they're trying to produce. Um, Discovery Video, for instance. I mean, they want to grow great, the best grapes possible. I want to make the best wine possible. Okay, how are we going to do that? And they essentially, I go out, um, I always source fruit the year before. Um, I'm, if I'm interested in a vineyard for, next, for uh, this year, I already scouted it last year. I want to see how they grow it. I want to see the canopy management. I want to see the vigor. I want to see the crop load. 
uh, I want to talk to them as far as um, I think the most important thing with any relationship is to make your your uh, expectations perfectly clear and as long as that is done and like yeah we can do that then I start a relationship with a grower and we see uh, and it's usually the first vintage I'm like get this as good as you can uh, what's going on per acre contract um, let's see what it does at three tons per acre um, and at this point I can just walk in and and I can just look at it. I mean, sometimes I'm almost like I can drive. I'm like, oh, well, hey, what's, 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 hey, you can kind of see it. If you're exposed to things hundreds and hundreds of times, it's sort of like looking through a microscope at uh, a million yeast. Um, you know when they look healthy and you know when they don't. And it's the same kind of um, instinct in the vineyard. Uh, so I manage growers more than anything. Um, some growers I don't get along with, but the fruit is great, and I'm like, okay, let's keep this going. Um, uh, other times they change ownership and it goes down the tube, and it's, it's a shame. Um, but I have certain set people that I love to work with, and I know, and it's, um, and it's always it's a small industry. You know who's, who's doing what, and you can look at, uh, um, but another, I guess another aspect too is, is if I can get to it. I mean, I need to make the trip, and it used to be a two-day trip, where I have to the, uh, all the vineyards. Uh, now it's like a one-day trip, and we kind of cut down a lot of our sourcing. Um, but I'm not going to get stuff from Wall Luke Slope. I mean, that's just too far away. I'm sorry. Um, that's the practical winemaker in me. I mean, you have to be practical at a certain level. Um, but that's kind of how I do it, and then um, we work with it, and usually um, I'm out there all the time. Uh, I usually start in June, um, and they kind of like that. They, what they hate, what a grower hates is when someone shows up at the pick and say, well, what happened? Like, why isn't it like this? And they're like, well, where were you in July when you could have told me to do that? So they like the fact that I'm out there all the time, and um, you know, I like it. I, I like being out there. I like driving. Um, I like being busy all the time, and you can't get any more busy than when you're driving. I mean, you shouldn't be more busy than you're driving, but I mean, I like it. Um, and I, uh, I just love being out there and looking at the fruit and, and, and fantasizing how good it's gonna be, and like, oh, this is gonna be a good year, or this is gonna be, and I start kind of making wine in June, July, I'm looking at berry size, I'm like, wow, this is really uneven um, for Asian. We have to consider that, and um, this past vintage, the seeds were very green, and I was, and, and you kind of, I start formulating a plan, or uh, maybe it's just a fantasy of what the vintage is going to be like and how I'm going to approach it, and um, and I'm at the point now where I kind of, I kind of feel like I know what I'm doing. It's been a long time. I mean, you're always in, the, I've always, uh, uh, I've learned that's kind of part of my process. Uh, is sometimes I'm like, oh, God, I just messed everything up. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Like, just ruin this whole vintage. And then three weeks later, I think that, um, you know, that scene in the Matrix when he like flexes and the makes, I mean, and sometimes I just feel all powerful, like a badass. Like no one can, you know, no one can top me. I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm the man. So um, those, those dips and things have kind of modulated through the years, but it's sort of, I've just learned that's part of my process of the create, like kind of blending and creating. And um, I always have that self doubt and always, uh, uh, but in, I don't know, the last three years, I'm kind of like, you know what? You always worry about these things and it's always great. And no one's gonna be able to tell anyway, probably. I mean, I'm tasting things 10, 20 times, like over and over. I'll come up with a blend. I'll start uh, the Pamplin blend probably in March, and I'll work on a single blend for probably two months just to get that just right. And sometimes I've, I go through it and I'm like, oh, this isn't good enough. I totally deconstruct it and start over again. And I always come back to like the same, same thing. So like again, that's me sleeping at night and knowing that I've gone to the, the very, done the very best I can do to my abilities to, to get it get it right. Um, but I guess to answer your thing about the grower, yeah, I manage growers. I don't like the vineyards. And I'm not going to go into somebody's vineyard and tell them how to grow grapes. Um, I'm going to work with somebody who already knows how to do it. And I'm not going to go in there and burn down anybody's house and like, well, well who wants to work with somebody like that? So, um, 
I work with people that are like, yeah, we're trying to grow the best fruit. I'm like, all right, let's, let's see how it works out. But the best thing to do is uh, you go in like the year before and then you can really, then you really tell. And then I sample fruit. They let me sample fruit and I taste it with my other vineyards. I'm like, ah, no. I'm like, whoa, this is pretty good. I wish I had this this year. Um, and then, um, yeah, I try to make just the most educated decision because it's, it's a big commitment. It's a lot of money. Um, and you got to do something with that wine. It better be good. If it isn't, it's kind of on you, basically. You talked earlier about your, your kind of your style aiming for, for balance in winemaking and precision. Tell me about what a balanced wine, what a, what a great wine, what are the characteristics for you? For me, it just has that harmonic. I mean, it has that bell that rings, you know, those Buddhist bells. That's a great wine. When you get it in your mouth and it just sings and it just rings, like, ping. I mean, you know it, right? If you had a wine like that, you just, it's just a beautiful and it has, it has depth, it has this. I mean, I look for wines that have this in the mid palate. Not like this little monolithic thing, like, you know, if you throw a lot of wood at something, that's what you have. So I'm looking for depth, mid palate depth, um, and finish is everything. Uh, the finish has to be long, everything has to be integrated, everything has to be perfect, basically. Um, uh, tannins can't be uh, in the way, but they have to list, they have to last just as long as the finish does. Everything has to kind of, like I said, it's like that long, and that, what's the Beatles song and uh, Sergeant Pepper's when they hit the, the final piano note, like, they, yeah, that's what, that's what a great wine is. And um, I think they all share that, that quality. Let's go back to my uni universal aesthetic. Uh, champagne is like that. A great Riesling is like that. Um, any, any example, Chardonnay, any, any great wine has that, that harmonic, that tone through it from start to finish. And no matter what it smells like, I mean, it can smell like Pinot, it can smell like Cab, it can smell whatever, but it, it will share the same, all great wines share the same characteristic, I think. Energy, too. Energy, movement through your palate. Um, uh, a lot of my scriptures I've developed over the years as far as my lexicon. Like, like tasting, and whenever I taste with somebody, I'm like, well, let's, we always got to kind of come work on the vocabulary. I got a, a barrel guy, his structure is my mouthfeel, and my mouthfeel is his structure, what he calls it. So. But he's French, so. <laughs> I defer to him. I will defer to the French, yeah, any day of the week. You talked about the, the time it took to kind of develop the sort of the confidence and the, the, the to kind of fight the self-doubt. So I'm curious, in the time you've been here at, at Pamplin, um, what are the, are there, are there milestones along the way as you look back? Are there times when you felt like you really kind of either mastered something or, or pulled off a challenge that was particularly, that particularly made you happy? Every one of us is a challenge, quite frankly. Every vintage is like a, it's like giving birth. I mean, it is, um, and it doesn't get any, it doesn't get easier. I mean, that's to me the challenge and that's kind of what's keeping me coming back. But, um, no, every year is like is hard. I mean, there's, 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 a, uh, there's every day, even during harvest, where you go above and beyond the call of duty. Like when I was in Napa, I'd be like out in a rainstorm, you know, on a ladder with putting a, you know, <laughs> the wind blowing and, you know, putting a tarp over the tanks. I mean, and, uh, or going out and uh, doing a green pass myself in a vineyard for four hours in 100 degree heat. I mean, Every year there's, there's something that you do that's like, you look back and like, I mean, I, I did it. Like that's, no one would have done that. But I did it because that's what needed to be done. And so every, but as far as milestones, I don't know. Um, uh, look at the vintage, 13s. Yeah, I can't say. I think I'm proud of all the wines, except maybe 2009. But even that tastes good now. It's getting better. It's kind of gone through its dip. Cab will do that. We'll go through its kind of little dumb period and then rise from the ashes. Uh, certain really great vintages like the 11, it never did that. It's just been great all along and it's just going to sail through. That might be one of our, our longest age wines. But yeah, milestones, I mean, every year there is something that 
uh, a new technique or uh, a new understanding. And that's what really um, excites me. I think, uh, what was in 20, was it 2021? I did, uh, I'm starting to make Pinot too. I experiment with Pinot Noir um, on the property and just learning the, uh, uh, the art of extended maceration. And then I'm like, well, I'm gonna do it on a cab. Let's see what that did. It was like a breakthrough to me. Um, and that was like, wow, I'm a new winemaker. And that was just two years ago. Like I'm a different, so it's every year is just, uh, um, it's never easy. I mean, it always kind of, it's always great. It kind of sucks too, <laughs> same time. <laughs> it's just the, uh, yeah, it's how it's just kind of the ebb and flow, I guess. I don't know if I've ever heard it summed up so perfectly and succinctly <laughs> before. Um, you mentioned, make, kind of messing around with Pinot Noir, you mentioned obviously Chardonnay projects. So tell me about, uh, as, you've got, as you've moved past Just Cab, uh, tell me how the other projects have come online and, and how they're going so far. Um, they're good. I mean, the 2018, it was, I guess they, they couldn't sell the fruit. And I was like, you can't let that just go to waste. I mean, I'm not going to leave it in the field. It's right here. So I made it and um, uh, it was a pain in the butt. It stuck and I had to restart it and it was just a mess and, um, and then it turned out well and then the owner had it and he's like, wow, that's the best Chardonnay I ever had. Can you make that every year? I'm like, yeah, I can, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult vineyard. It's cool. It's a very cool site. Um, I didn't make it in 19 because it just got a little well. I, didn't, um, I got a little, little freaked out about the rain. Now I'm, I'm kind of cool with it. Um, coming from Washington, it's, there's never any rain there. but. Um, uh, yeah, every year it's getting better. I'm just learning how to learn the vineyard. Um, so in 2021, I pushed it really hard and picked it kind of ripe. And then this year I did it the opposite. I'm like coming at the opposite way. Cause the challenge is to get it through ML cause the city is so high. Uh, and I finally learned how to do that this year. I mean, that was a breakthrough. It just kept it at 75 degrees or 70, 75 degrees and it just, it did it. Um, and then before I was like playing with the acid and trying to, you know, cause the ML, the lactic acid hates, you know, low pH. And so I'm like, raise the pH and temperature and that worked. But this year I think I kind of nailed that. And, um, and I'm kind of learning that like those wines, you just kind of pick, you can pick on the numbers, I think. Cabernet, you can't, you gotta wait for the tannins. You gotta wait for the skins. It's a much more uh, involved picking decision with Cabernet. Uh, Pinot Noir, um, I might've learned that this year. That might've been breakthrough. It was like, just pick it at 22, 25 and that, you know, I mean, in certain hotter vintages, you have to let it get maybe 23 and above or something. Um, but this year it was like, well, it's at 23 and a half, 23. And it's gonna rain in four days. Let's, let's just pick it, easy decision. Um, Chardonnay the same way. I was like, well, where's it at? It's at, um, it's at 22 and a half. Um, the flavors have been in there since 20 bricks. Like, let's just get it. Like, why not? And worry about the acid or see what it does later. And, then, um, and I finally got it in some real barrels this year. The first year I made it, I made it out of Bordeaux, like converted Bordeaux barrels. And then the second year I did the same. I just, you know, turned a red barrel and a white barrel. And then last year was uh, in 2021, it's the first year where like, hey, maybe I should get a burgundy barrel um, and get in some real wood and get serious about this. And then last year is, it's, um, it's just every, every year is a new level. And um, this year I went in and did a, um, it's hard to do a green pass on Chardonnay because you can't see the color like a red wine. So what I did this year is I did a, um, a flowering pass I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's go in and do a pass in any, any um, uh, cluster that's behind fluorescence, let's just take it off and then we'll do our pass now and then we'll get to crop level. And especially in a cool site like this, if you got to pick early, everything has got to be even. Um, and you can't really, that's the only way you can, I think you can do it with Chardonnay is go through there. So that was a breakthrough in the vineyard, um, getting crop level right um, at the right level. Um, I'm getting good at crop predictions. I never thought I could do that either. I mean, we're like right on the money as far as our pick and our rows and I have it all carved out the vineyard and I walk all the rows and everything. So um, I think it's going great. I'm excited. I think it's going to be good. I mean, people really like the 2020. Uh, the 2021 is even better. Um, I think it's priced right what we're doing and it smells like a Chardonnay. I mean, it smells and I think there's a lot of potential. 
And um, I think in a, a really good year and with good management, I think it would be a consistent thing. Because consistency is key. Like you have, to, you have to get it. You have to get it right every year. Here, this is going to be a lot more um, vintage variations, but, but I'm excited. It's something new. It's something for me to kind of um, understand and, and get excited about it. I mean, I just go down and look at my barrels. I'm like, there you are. Like, how are you doing? Like, this is great. And I just I'm dreaming like how good it's going to be or what, what I need to do next or um, I need to learn as far as stirring re regime. I'm experimenting with uh, holding back lees from pre previous vintage and adding that back, especially in a leaner wine to give it more weight and, and body. Um, I'm putting in stainless steel for a long time. Um, Chardonnay, it seems like you let it die and then you put it in stainless steel for three or four months in totally uh, anaerobic conditions and it just, it just comes back to life again. I mean, I never did that at Palmyre. I mean, I made a lot of Chardonnay every year at Palmyre and we just stir it, stir it once a week. It was sort of the same recipe every year. Stir, 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 stir. Um, put in this wood and then bottle, blah, blah, blah. And we never let it rest like that. And then what it does is it really brings back um, kind of that, that, that hazelnutty, lychee nut kind of flavors and stuff. So, no, it's exciting. I like, I like making better and better wine. I mean, that's kind of my purpose. Um, so I think probably maybe in two more years, I'll probably have the, the style down, but um, uh, we'll see. Like I said, you have to kind of, sometimes you can, there's how many great wines there in the world? Thousands. And there's just as many different ways to make them. So um, I don't really subscribe to any dogma. I don't have any rules like this is how you're supposed to make wine. And that's the only way. Uh, I, how differently do you have to approach Chardonnay from the kind of the, the, your kind of normal uh, Cabernet making? Like my approach, my approach is the same. I think, I mean, my o overlying philosophy or, um, no, it's pretty much, um, I kind of make all wine the, I don't want to say make it all the same, but it has all the same intent, I guess, to be, um, to take the most care possible. Just thinking about sort of in terms of technique wise, is there a different technique to, to making something like Chardonnay versus something like Cabernet? Um, beyond the obvious, as far as the, uh, the actual fermentation, um, well, the stirring is the big thing. Like you never would stir lees in Cabernet because there's never a free lunch. That's one of my most famous uh, in, uh, in, intern uh, like rules. There's never a free lunch in winemaking. Like what you gain doing something, you're going to lose somewhere else. Like especially in Cabernet, if you're going to, there's, um, the way we made Cabernet in Napa is very oxidative. We'd rack it, splash rack it every 10 weeks. It was kind of Darwinian winemaking. So whatever survived was like the palmire, and then whatever wasn't was adjacent, and then just the stuff that you just killed or murdered with all the oxygen, we just bulked out. Um, here, I'm just completely opposite. I don't, there isn't any oxygen at all. I don't rack my Cabernets at all. I don't add sulfur to them. Um, I just let them kind of evolve slowly, let the barrel do the work. And then I don't add sulfur to my cabs until um, the following year, I would say. Right, be right be excuse me, right before vintage. Uh, but I can do that. I mean, it's, I, I have my own winery, I have my own, my own microflora and my own ecosystem. Um, I don't, I'm not bad, I don't have to play defense. Now, if I worked in another winery where or custom crush place, whereas, like I said, with every kind of bug available, I probably solve for it right away. I mean, you have to play defense. But here, it's uh, I've my my winemaking has evolved with this building, and I can do things that I wouldn't be able to do anywhere else. I don't allow any other equipment in here. I never would ever buy used barrels. Um, gosh, when the guys from Anime would come over, I have them like spray alcohol on their feet, and you know, especially during harvest. Um, I don't allow any outside equipment in here or anything. I preserve, because I think, um, I just want to create all that hassle, like having to manage Brett, like what a nightmare. I mean, then my, my winemaking would have to change. I'd have to change my whole approach as far as um, not uh, getting any air. But I guess the difference between, I'd say the main thing other than the obvious things is that Chardonnay, you will stir lees. Um, I'm still in that research development phase now where, um, well, how much is too much? Um, 
how much is too little? Like, is it vintage dependent? Is it um, acid? I mean, there's so many variables. Um, I think a lot of times, um, as a winemaker, you can start to kind of believe your own BS, like your own kind of deal what you think is true. Um, you just can't believe everything you think, I guess, as a winemaker. And um, always question yourself and, and be on your, um, so for, for me, that's kind of the main, I guess the barreling difference, I guess, would be the least thing. Um, but like I said, there's no free lunch. What you lose, if you're stirring leaves, you could lose uh, fruit presence and clarity. Um, and, but what you gain is mouthfeel, and I think Chardonnay is, it needs to be a good, good, good wine. It's gotta be delicious. Like I don't want, um, I'm, I don't want to make a, a lemon juice um, and I don't want to make some, something so oaky and flabby that it's like that oily, you know, like a Viognier or something. Um, I want it to be uh, delicious and like I can't stop drinking this. The greatest Chardonnays in the world, that's what they taste like. Um, I've been to Ramenet, I've been to all like uh, Suze, I've tasted like Grand Cru stuff and it's just like, you want to chug it, it's so good. And that's kind of the, I guess, the style I'm shooting for um, with this. I don't, I don't have like any philosophy or any statement I need to make. Like, uh, it needs to smell like burnt rubber um, or matchsticks, which I, I, is kind of the trend here. Um, it's got to smell good. It's got to taste great. I mean, um, I don't think Chardonnay is like a uh, uh, intellectual, like <laughs> you're sitting, you know, like a Pinot might be. I mean. And God, it's got to smell good. Jeez, I don't know how many bottles I've opened here from the area there. It's just like, like it smells like burnt sesame seeds. I mean, that, they're going for that reductive style, which I just don't, I think that's kind of a, I don't know, that's kind of a dead end, I think. But like I said, that's just my opinion. I have my opinions. People love those wines and they, they're much more successful wineries than, than what I'm doing here, so who am I to say? So. But great burgundy does not smell like that. I mean, I guess that would be my point. That um, sort of each, each vintage is its own challenge, of course. I'm curious about, even though your, your, your grapes are not centered here in the valley, I'm curious about 2020 for you, uh, between the pandemic and between the fires of that year, uh, what was that vintage like for you? Are there any, specific, any kind of individual challenges in 2020 that you had to deal with? And what were your sort of solutions to? <laughs> I, get, I, I think I have PTSD every time I smell smoke. I get like, I, I get really anxious. I have like an emotional reaction when I smell smoke. Um, no, it was horrible. My interns weren't like, were okay. One guy was, I don't know. I don't know if I could trust him. Um, and Washington, it wasn't so bad. Washington, it was a lot of, like, a lot of high level stuff. But um, come to find out, they had it a lot worse than I thought um, because um, I'm not out there all the time. And my intern didn't tell me like, wow, it's really smoky out here. Um, they ha um, here was just, God, it was a nightmare. You couldn't go outside, you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't open your windows. Uh, it was the most miserable, I say two week experience. It was almost like 10 days. Um, we couldn't work outside. Uh, couldn't get out in the vineyard. Uh, Washington didn't suffer so much. It was, it was bad out there though too. Um, yeah, it was horrible. Um, the Chardonnay was good though. Uh, and the wines in 2020 were, um, I just think my, my odd vintage, the odd vintage is always stronger vintages in Washington for some reason. Um, I haven't tasted the 2020s in a while. So I don't, um, I kind of have to go back and reassess them, but um, uh, it wasn't like a phenomenal great vintage, but it was, certainly wasn't a bad one. I mean, the Cabernet, I didn't really get any smoke taint in any of my Cabernet. And the Pinot I made here was like horrible. That was bad. Um, it was like barbecue chips. But it was, a, it was a learning experience. I mean, if anything, you got it like the silver lining was that like I know like if you go in a vineyard and you come home and you smell it on your clothes, it's in the, it's in the fruit. There's no like uh, making up something or making yourself feel better about it. If there's like smoke in a vineyard for any length of time, like a couple of days, it's, it's gonna be there. Um, there's no way it can't. It's depending on like when, 
Uh, I just, there just needs to be the research done. I mean, I imagine at different phenological stages, some is better than worse, and some varietals are exhibited more than worse. But um, on a certain level, I mean, certain wines, I mean, you're like, well, it just tastes like it was in a radu barrel. I mean, uh, some cooperage is just really smoky and, and, and not very appealing. So um, I think it was a really big problem for the winemakers, but as far as consumers, I don't know. I, don't, uh, I haven't had really any 2020s. Um, I think I'm sure everybody made like, like drinkable wines. Um, nothing to hang your hat on, I don't think, but, um, but it's a shame because it was a great vintage. It was really, it was the Pinot was tasting so good. I've never tasted fruit off the vine where it like tasted like wine. Like it tasted like, I mean, and then the smoke hit like two days later and then we couldn't pick anything because we didn't want our crews out there in the smoke. So, um, that's what sucks about 2020 because it could have been a really great vintage, I think, especially around here. I mean, it was, the weather was great. So tell me about, sort of, let's look ahead a little bit. Um, what's coming up for you uh, uh, here at Pamplin or, or personally? Uh, what, are, what, are, what are you looking ahead to in the future? Um, I'm looking ahead to like maybe do different varietals. I'm always looking to get new vineyards. I think, um, for this program here. Um, I would like to, because um, we have all these state stuff here, and of course, Anna Mee um, gets most of it, but um, I would like, like to make some, I don't know, I even, shouldn't even say this, because then I'll have to make it. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about maybe making some Pinot Gris Rosé this year, but that could be a big mistake, because then I might have to make it all the time, so. <laughs> That I kind of might want to look forward and play around with it. Because that's one of the best rosés I had that Thomas made at NME. He used to do a, a rosé from the Pinot Gris. And it was like, wow, this is, that was one of his best wines. So I'm curious about that. Because um, then I get to learn something new. I mean, I, I have to be moving forward. If, we're, if I'm just stuck doing the same thing, then I'm just, yeah. It's like what's the old joke. It's like a fish. I'm like a shark. I have to keep, I have to keep moving forward. So I just need new challenges. And the Pinot is fun for me to do. Uh, I think I kind of cracked that egg last year, though, on that. And then, um, yeah, just like, uh, it'd be nice for us to like really start moving ahead on the direct-to-consumer stuff, and I like to see that happening. But um, yeah, I'm kind of, um, I got the, the cab dialed in, I think, for now, and I'd like to do some new, new stuff, new bridles, I think. But a state, working with state fruit, that's where it's at. I mean, that's, that's the control. I mean, and that's what you, and um, I'm kind of, that's my winemaking is about, on a certain, well, any winemaking is about controlling the, the variables, and that's, yeah, I used to be really in, I used to be a big wine fan. I was a lot of bottles all the time, but now I'm just not. It's just too expensive. I don't have that disposable income. Like, I got to pay for like softball like pants and I mean, there's always that point where you're like, "Well, oh, the wine's really good." I'm like, "Wow, oh, this is great! Like, this is the greatest job ever!" Like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, you got to like maybe half an hour in, and it just absorbs through your mouth. And then come three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm just like, oh, I get a headache in my stomach and. So blending for me, that's the worst. Everyone thinks that's the coolest part of being a winemaker, but when I blend, I'll taste every day, four days a week, three hours a day, and it's just, it's just it's all this gray hair. I mean, it just really beats me up. I really, it takes a lot out of me, and I don't, I don't even taste wine for like two months after that, because we usually bottle in June, and then no wine until maybe harvest or my interns or something, but. Word to like budding, budding winemakers. Like, you think the tasting is, yeah, it's, uh, and it, it's tough. It's very emotionally draining too, because you want it to be great. And a lot of times you just, you're just pushing and pushing and pushing. And you're like, well, it's not, it's good. It's, and uh, I'm always trying to get it to the perfect point, And that's when it's emotionally, it's, it's really draining for me. And you mentioned earlier that you don't, really, you're not really too plugged into the Oregon wine industry. But I am curious about your sort of your perspectives from from having watched it grow. Uh, what have you noticed in the Oregon wine industry? Where, what what has happened here, and maybe where is it? Where do you see it going? I don't know. I um, I just think there's so many places that shouldn't be planted, 
um, the vigor is just crazy around here, viticulturally wise. Um, where it's going, you see where it's going, like big players are coming in. I think it's good um, as far as salary wise um, for winemakers. Um, having big players like Kendall Jackson come in, that's, that's, I think that's a good thing because they're total pros and they pay their winemakers like Napa salaries. And um, to have that kind of come up here would be nice to kind of, we're kind of far behind in that way, I would say that respect. Um, uh, I have to say, I don't really, I don't really have much opinion really about it. Um, I'm not plugged in. I'm not drinking the wines. I'm not, um, I don't network and I don't hobnob. I don't, um, I'm not trying to get clients. I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of my own little, this is it. Like my own little world. <laughs> we are all alone. So, so when he comes, I always say when I have visitors, I'm like an old grandma. I'm like, <laughs> Like, tell me how long you're going to stay here, because I'm always alone. No one's ever, no one ever to talk to. So I love having visitors and pouring wine and hanging out, and it, it can be a very extended affair and stuff like that. But um, uh, yeah, I think everybody, it's, uh, from where I heard, it's great. <laughs> People get along and help each other, you know, all those tropes the, 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 about the Oregon wine industry. Like, everyone helps, helps themselves out. And, but it's, it's kind of, for me, it's, it's a lot of uh, family-run businesses like this one and, uh, and old school bootstrap winemaking, um, save every penny kind of deal. Uh, I've heard nightmare stories from like, you what? You like have to load your press with a five gallon bucket. I mean, are you kidding me? Stuff like that. Um, but yeah, who am I to say? I mean, people are successful here. Um, okay, last question for you then. Um, advice or words of wisdom for people who wanted to get into the wine industry? Uh, I would say it's like you got to be 100%. You can't, you, um, I always tell my interns is you're like a boxer. Um, if you're not boxing, you're resting. So if you're not making wine, then you should be selling wine. If you're not selling wine, then you should be um, uh, selling books that are about wine. I mean, you have, there's so much to learn, there's so much breadth of knowledge, and, and it's very experience-based. Um, I recommend people go to school. Um, not just because I did, because you can say probably about two or four years on your career, I would say, and get you the head start. It's important to have the science down and to know that um, just when it comes to fixing things. I mean, if you're just gonna like pick grapes and throw them in your thing and let them what they did in 2000 AD, um, <laughs> then, then fine, that's, that's cool if that's the way you want to go at it. But um, if you want to be a commercial winemaker and actually uh, work for somebody and um, have a career at it, then I would say the school is, is important. Because for me as an employer, it means that like, you're serious about it too. Um, granted, a lot of people go to school and never worked in a winery. And then when they work in it, they're like, I didn't realize I had to work this hard. Like, I don't want to do this. So there's that happening too. But um, yeah, you got to be 100%. It's exciting. It's fun. People are, uh, it's a great industry. Um, you got to like to drink wine or at least have um, some kind of aesthetic. I, I'd always recommend people whenever they're tasting them write down their notes. This is my intern talk. Um, whenever you taste things, because then it helps you in your mind when you're writing things down, it helps you somehow make the connection uh, and you really need to develop your palate. You need to taste, 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 taste wine, taste with other people. Because um, in the end of the day, a winemaker, you're only as good as your palate. That's what I am. That's what I get paid for is my palate. Um, all the other techniques and my dazzling seller uh, skills, um, that's, that's good too because then I can, I can do all the work myself. We don't have to hire anybody. But, um, your palate, that's, that's everything. And taste great wine. It's like world, I mean, spend the money, go to the mountain. I mean, if you're in the food, what is $500 for lunch at, at the French Laundry really? I mean, to taste that, that level of excellence and see like what service is really like a Michelin star service is. I mean, you gotta go to the mountain. Um, you don't have to spend $3,000 on the uh, 82 Lafitte, but um, certainly like get up there and in your first job work for someone who knows what they're doing. That's the key. Because um, they are going to set the tone for your career. Like get, like if it comes down to like having a really great internship at a, an amazing winery or your first job out of college to pay your, um, at a mediocre place just to pay your student loan, 
take the internship. Like get your pedigree. Like learn because that's important because that's how you're going to learn learn the ins and outs and uh, is from someone who knows themselves. And people don't get those great jobs because they're dummies. I mean, they get those because um, they're talented and they know they know the industry. And it's it's not easy to make great wine. Everyone thinks it's like oh, it just makes itself. It's not. It's, there's so many things that go wrong. And I would say start your career down in Napa. Go down there. There's way more opportunity. There's so much talent down there. Um, and then you'll get your job as assistant winemaker and your salary, and then you move up here, become a winemaker, and get the same salary. <laughs> so, yeah, start start down there. I mean, uh, I, my intern, I have a great intern. Um, I actually named a piece of equipment after him here at the winery. Uh, and he followed my advice, and he's down in Kauai. He's doing great, and he, but he still wants to get up here, but it's, he can't. There's just no movement up here. There's not a lot of opportunity up here. Down in Napa, people change jobs every two years, I would say. So you can really learn a lot down there. And then build your pedigree, then come up here or go someplace else. But education, yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be 100%. You gotta be in it. You gotta eat, drink, sleep, winemaking, at least the first 10 years of your career. And then when you get into like my stage, then, then you worry about softball practice. And, whether my heart rate is at the right, you know, when I'm getting home from my bike ride here, it's like, <laughs> before it gets dark. But um, no, I, I recommend it, it's great, it's, uh, but you gotta love wine and your palate and you really need to, uh, there's so many things you need to learn, it's just like you cannot, you just gotta go for it. Excellent advice, appreciate it. Um, all the questions that I have for you, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't cover that you would like to cover? Oh, I don't know. I got to kind of give my whole soap, soapbox speech, intern speech to you there. That's, that's uh, excellent. <laughs> He's very so wait, you need a job? This I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for some of this. <laughs> Being your work? No, nope, you're covered. You got, you got your gig. Um, no, I don't. I don't think there is anything else. I don't. I don't know. I'm sure I some kind of point I wanted to make, but I think I made enough points. I guess. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing your space up here with us, yeah. sharing your opinions with us, and uh, we're going to let you off the hook. Yeah. And Thank you. Thank you.